You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 34 in the Christian Standard Bible say, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. Here, St. Paul writes to the church at Corinth about correct practices for the church. He is talking about the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, in this pericope. Uh, Paul condemns using the sacrament as a means for your meal or for getting drunk, as some in the church were doing at the time. Uh, Pastor Will, why do you believe it was important to Paul that the church treat this practice as separate from mealtime? Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, we're talking about the early church here and Paul, they're all trying to figure out what all this means. And so so Paul is uh, kind of laying out for them some instructions of how this can go, because this particular letter to the church in Corinth, we know they had other things going on, too. They're arguing about spiritual gifts. They're arguing about who had the better spiritual gifts. They're arguing about all kinds of different things. There's a lot of disorganization. So he's trying to set some parameters around uh, what's going on at this practice. Yeah, we gather to have a meal and fellowship and be together as a community. But if you're abusing that, uh, then let's let's think through what gathering for a meal and to feed the hungry is and um, kind of what's going on with this idea when Jesus says, hey, when you break bread, you share this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And this is also my body and blood given for you. So, so he's really trying to lay out some early theology around what this kind of sacrament is, this rite, this practice, this worship uh, gathering for, for the early community. So I, I tend to focus in on that word, therefore, you know, when Paul ever says, you know, therefore, I, I think he's trying Trying to lay out what what the church should do when they gather together so that there's not conflict so there's not competition so we can grow together as a family of god and much like the new spider-man tried really hard to to say with great power comes with great responsibility without using the words Preston will tried really hard to say what is there for <laughs> without <laughs> saying what is the there for <laughs> exactly <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite Church Unity Podcast. You're probably in your seats cheering because, good news, the boys are back. TJ and I are both on the same episode of our podcast for the first time in a month. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. Big news. Um, yeah. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Knoll, as I mentioned, the one, the only, the ones podcast we're started for. Um, you, know, you know, a lot of times they create different things in sci-fi movies to channel great power so that it doesn't destroy planets. Well, the reason podcasts were created was so that the greatness of TJ's vocal abilities doesn't shatter the earth. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. TJ, thank you for joining us and not shattering the earth with your presence. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. We are also joined by the one, the only, your favorite Lutheran pastor, um, the one, the only, for us psych fans, the magic head. Pastor Will Rose, how's it going? Good. I'm glad I could bring you two together. You know, it's been a while. Yeah. I'm the one who kind of <laughs> brought you two together. And um, I'm possibly, uh, possibly your favorite Lutheran pastor named Will. I don't know if I'm your favorite Lutheran pastor, but at least those named Will, I could be up there at least at the top. At least top three, I hope. Yeah. 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 Def- comfortably top three for me, at least. <laughs> <laughs> comfortably yeah. top yeah. three. Comfortably. I uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what greater form of unity is there than bringing your favorite church unity podcast together again. <laughs> mm-hmm. I uh, Yeah, this is going to be a fun episode, um, an exciting episode. We're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, communion. It goes by many names. Um, 
going all the way back to the very first episode of our show, like 180 episodes ago or something. Wow. When we were talking to Pastor Gary, one of the things that keeps getting brought up and it's kept getting brought up ever since is the way we come together in unity is by getting closer to Jesus, the thing that we're about, right? And a lot of people will say, especially in some other church traditions, that that is all what communion is, is we're participating in who Jesus is. But the question today, is it literally him, figuratively him, fake him? What is Jesus's <laughs> blood alcohol <laughs> content percentage yet? Oh, well, we're going to talk about all that, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um- since you're already here, you might as well take the extra step. And if you're already there, congratulations to check out the Honest Owl Ministries podcast network. The link's in the show notes. Uh, you can also get a paid subscription for the network on Apple Podcasts. A little, little convenient for you Apple people. Just saying, putting that out there. And um, there's also paid subscriptions on Captivate and Patreon for extra content where you can support our ministry. Yeah, yeah. And if you're tired of hearing us talk about supporting our ministry, well, good news. We're going to talk about... Since since we have one of the hosts of Systematic Geekology with us here today, the one and only Will Rose. Also, mm-hmm. TJ and I are also hosts, but eh, who cares about that? We, we're going to go full geek for today's favorite Unity segment, The Silly Question. TJ and I will answer first. TJ before all, all others, of course. Which of the Great Lake Avengers do you believe has the greatest chance of defeating Darth Bane? For listeners' sake, Great Lake Avengers is just the Avengers in like the Northwest different superhero group darth bane is um the guy who started the rule of two for the sith yeah and just to add a little bit more about the avengers because you had the like the main team the avengers and then there was a spinoff team called the west coast avengers led by hawkeye and then uh in i i looked it up because um even though i get my lutheranism from uh wisconsin that (laughs) uh this this wisconsin base avengers team its first appearance was in west coast avengers number 46 in 1989 and so john byrne created this whole separate team and i had to go look it up so now i need to go read a lot of um uh, great lake avengers yeah. since that's where yeah. my the 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 burling lutheran side of my heritage comes from so who knows uh, i may have a great 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 cousin who's you know was a part of the west coast or great lake avengers it, it, yeah. they're pretty good to be honest i think it's it's really funny most of the time yeah mm-hmm. all right tj so i would like to say um i don't think it's fair if we include deadpool deadpool was on the great lakes avengers briefly yeah i also thought about that like that's just he just rewrites the story if he wants to (laughs) yeah so i'm gonna say it's it's gonna be squirrel girl squirrel girl could beat darth bane for sure squirrel girl also left the team because she realized they were leaning too much on how great she is yeah, because she she really is. I um, Squirrel Girl has like um, her powers is that she like she, she's kind of like Ant Man, like can psychically <laughs> like connect with all squirrels. And yeah, if you've yeah. seen that Rick and Morty episode where the squirrels take over the world or run an underground like coup to overthrow governments, it, it could be a big big power. Yeah, there's yeah, a one I'm, shot where she beat Thanos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know about that. She she can beat Thanos, um, which is probably the most correct answer but to give a different answer from tj anyway um i'm gonna go with doorman he uh opens doors different portals using the dark energy the dark forces that be the dark side of the force if you will so i, I you know i think it'd be a really fun dark side versus dark side match i think you can put up a good fight all right well <laughs> nice yeah since uh you took deadpool off the table that was up there that's how I talked about. no no i I think um, isn't the leader of the team of the Great Lake Avengers is Mister or Immortal? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's just like somebody who like regenerates and resurrects and you know um, can come come back from the dead, or it's like he's immortal. So like no matter what you do to him, he's going to come back. Similar to like Deadpool, is always heals, and you could you know just reduce Deadpool to like a single cell, and he might regenerate <laughs> to, to something else. And yeah. I don't I don't he know does. all about Mister Immortal, but I th- if I think if you're going against a, a, a Sith Lord, uh, being immortal would probably help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I question whether or not Darth Bane's immortal. He's coming back, holding out hope. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Come up on. For that's Come what on the Lucas new Ray movie's about. That's a different Come on Lucas film. That's that's who that's who Snoke should have been anyway. That would have been sick. Or so much better. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Or Vitiate. Or Plagueis. 
Uh, there's a lot of better options. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Will, we know a lot about your story and testimony and how you grew up in the Lutheran tradition. Could you tell us about the first time you remember hearing the Eucharist taught or done in a way differently than what you were taught growing up? Yeah, so so growing up, um, Lutheran, kind of lifelong Lutheran, created Lutheran, baptized Lutheran, I um, uh, kind of a, a weekly or if not every other Sunday kind of practice of communion, which is a part of the worship experience that, that I experienced growing up. But first time I remember like hearing it taught, we, they had a first communion class in my home congregation at, at third grade. So baptize infants later on, you'll take confirmation when you're like middle school age. But before you take confirmation, before you receive the sacrament, you have your first communion. And at my church, uh, my experience was third grade. So I went through this class with my home pastor. They let us do like a taste testing of like the the wafer and like a little, tiny little sip of wine or grape juice if you wanted that. And uh, they gave us our, our first communion and after taking that course, doing a little uh, like workbook and talking about it, reading some scripture and hearing the pastor teach. And then, and then on our first communion, we got not just like a plastic cup that you sip out of and then it kind of, you get thrown away. We had like a little glass, little glass cup, almost like a, like a little shot glass where we had our first communion in that and we were able to keep that little glass cup and take it home with us. So it was like a Jesus shot glass. Do you still have it? I, I can't find it. I'm sure it's at my parents' house somewhere. For the longest time, I remember using it like when I brushed my teeth to take a little sip of water, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, it was in my it was my bathroom. Um but but we can talk about uh, practice later about what you know. It used to be that Lutheran churches would have a first communion, similar to Catholic church or or others. But that practice has changed a little bit to where we now say that. Um, once you're baptized, you're welcome to the table. So it's really at a parent's discretion that they could, once they're a baby, and we could feed them a little kind of little tiny crumb of bread of communion if the parent wanted it. But there's no like age limit on on um, on communion. That once you're baptized, you're welcome to the table. And later on, we might have some communion instruction a little bit older in elementary age or uh, during just confirmation, which is uh, or take catechism when we learn about the small catechism and the sacraments and Martin Luther and the Bible that we just kind of communion is lumped in with all of that. So my church practices communion every single or Eucharist, Holy Communion every Sunday. And there's no age requirement. It's really kind of up to the parents of when they think it's best for their kid, but we say all are welcome to the table. And then later on, we do instruction to learn what it's all about, what is age appropriate. Um, yeah. Since I'm still learning too, it's not like, well, once you understand it, you can then receive communion. We're like, you know, we, we're always learning, lifelong learners. So we're always learning what this, what this means to us. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you ever saw it done in a different way? Um, yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, my dad grew up Baptist, and so maybe we, um, I have a, a a memory of going to his hometown church and going to church on, on Sunday, and instead of, uh, in the Lutheran church, we would walk to the altar and receive the bread and the wine. Um, in the Baptist church, this particular Baptist church, I think most still do this, you kind of let the, the communion come to you. They pass around a tray and have like a little cracker and a little thing of grape juice on it, and so... Um, it kind of rotated at your seat. They passed the tray around. Interesting. I remember the first time I heard of or saw it done differently, oddly enough, was at a non-denominational church at while I was attending UNCW. Um, mm -hmm. You know, me and Will both went there. Um, mm -hmm. Wilmington, North Carolina, we had a the non-denominational church. It was Crossway. It was basically SBC light, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or like a faux SBC, if you will. But they did communion every Sunday. And mm. for me, that that was a bit of a shock. I, I was used to, you know, maybe once a quarter, four times a year, maybe kind of iffy if we did it that much, you know. So the first time I went, I was like, oh, man, I picked a great Sunday. I happened to pick communion Sunday. <laughs> and then the next time I went, I was like, oh. And then that's when I remember like talking to other people about it and hearing a lot of like people I actually get really upset about that idea because you're in a lot of people's minds, you're demeaning communion by doing it every Sunday. It's no longer something special. And um, I hadn't, that was the first time I ever heard anything like that at all or knew there was any real disagreements. And since then, yeah. I've come a long way. I mean, I, I see all perspectives. I prefer to do it every Sunday in remembrance. 
But I do understand that other side of trying to keep it something special too. Um, TJ, yeah, I, oh. no, I, just just in terms of the the keep it special argument, like I I heard the 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 argument or or the point made that like you know what if I only told my wife I loved her on her birthday and anniversary? Uh, because <laughs> if I said it if I said it other times, then it's just going to make it less meaningful if I told her I loved her um, other than those big special days. And so it's like why not hear, tell her every day in a meaningful special way? Um, um, and so, so that kind of changed my mind. Like, yeah, yeah. That every time we gather, and also, if I if I'm leading a worship service, and what if my sermon's a stinker, you know, and um, <laughs> and they don't hear any good news, and I just really butcher the text, then at least they'll hear the good news that the body and blood of Christ was given for them, and uh, they can receive that as, as good news. So, so even if the hymns are bad, if something else goes wrong in our service, at least they'll. They'll, I can look uh, a church member in in the eyeballs and say the body of Christ given for you um, as a means mm-hmm. of grace, and they can take that home with them. Yeah, and that's um to pile on against those people who only do it once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah, I also to me it really and maybe this is just some of my own background, and my own biases, and different stuff, but it seems a lot less dangerous for those churches that are more sacrament oriented. Because it's not all the focus on the pastor the whole time. I mean, not that that doesn't still happen, but uh, you know, I've seen a little bit less of that when you're putting the focus somewhere other than just the sermon each week. Um, TJ, when was the first time you saw or heard of communion being done different than I know we kind of grew up the same way with it? But uh, sure, I honestly have no idea when the first time I saw it was done differently was. Maybe Fair. in like middle school, I became friends uh, with uh, this Catholic girl who lived in like Virginia. It wasn't my thing, you know, mm-hmm. just talked. And uh, I found out they did communion a lot. I yeah. Like, That's crazy. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is a little bit shocking when you're not used to it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, it was like she was attending her communion service, I think is what it was. And I was like, what do yeah. you mean your communion service? Yeah. Weird. But yeah, everybody does a little bit different. Um, and, and yeah, like, we mentioned we're going to talk about a little bit later, you know, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, all that. There's a lot of differences. Um, and part of what I was getting at earlier with the sacraments, that's why we're going to do next year, we're going to start a series on sacraments. We're going to talk about some of the different leaders, you know, who've been on the show before of just how sacraments are done differently and what are the importance of them. Um, of course, we'll be following a, C- a series we're going to start here the fall about church imagery. But for now, we're talking about the Eucharist. Um, a lot of people put a lot of importance on this. I know we've had um, one of the other hosts of Systematic Ecology, friend of our show, Kino Kennedy. Um, he's a reverend at the Anazal, or the Anazal, <laughs> AME Zion Church. And um, he has said a few times on our show that for him, in order to have church unity, the big thing is really just do you take the Lord's Supper and do you baptize? If you do those two, he says that's all that matters to him. Um, and and you know, we've had other people who said similar things on the show. So Pastor Will, how important is this practice to you and why is it so important to some people? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's the central act of of why we gather. Back back to kind of the verse we heard from Paul. It's just like the early church was gathering around this meal together and remembering Jesus and always taking him, also taking him at his word when he says, this is my body and blood given for you, connecting it with that Passover um, celebration that's so critical for for um, the Hebrews and this understanding of liberation, this understanding of salvation, of, of being brought to new life, that, that Jesus was connecting his own sacrificial act of um, dying and rise again to this, this Passover meal and bread broken, wine poured. So, so to me, it's the central act of why we gather on a Sunday to remember um, the crucified and, and risen Christ. Um, uh, that being said, like I understand that that there's a diversity out there in terms of how it's practiced or what you use and and the words that go with it and and all those kind of things. Martin Luther, when he said, "Where somebody asked, well, wh- where is the church?" He said, "Where where the word of God is preached and the sacraments are are practiced." And so, I mean, that's. A lot of wiggle room in there in terms of like frequency and and how it's done, but you know where the word of God is preached and <laughs> yeah. where the sacraments are administered, uh, that that's where the church is. So you know, um, 
so so for me, I I, I hear what Kino is saying, and I, and I agree uh, because it, for me, it's I I couldn't go to a church where that isn't the 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 kind of high life crescendo of the worship service on Sunday Sunday morning. Yes, um, Word and Sacrament Lutheran Church, you know the the altar and the pulpit are side by side for each other. Uh, they one doesn't go without the other. So um, that's kind of kind of where I am because I think that's. Um, Kind of where where the early church was and how it grew out of that and and Jesus' intention of of keeping the church sustained and nourished, uh, so they can go out and be His hands and feet in the world. So, would you say like specifically the issue of whether you're doing communion each Sunday for you is more of a second tier thing? Then, like you would still maybe consider someone brother or sister in Christ if they only did it once a quarter, but you wouldn't sure. want to go to that church. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like okay. I couldn't be a member of that church because I don't uh, that that wouldn't be part of my own spiritual discipline and, and practice. But but I would definitely still consider them a brother and sister in Christ for sure. Okay. Cool. Sweet. Sweet. So, what do you know about the history of belief behind this sacrament, and what did Martin Luther change or challenge the Cat- Catholic Church on concerning this practice? Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, back to that uh, verse from Paul, like I think from the very beginning, it was the the early church that, um, you know, kind of anchored its life and rhythm of their week um, and celebrating the resurrection on Resurrection Day, Sunday, the first day of the week with with communion and a meal and then going out and serving it to others um, and, and being uh, continuing what Jesus did in the world uh, by being his followers. So, I, and of course, there's a lot of history over a thousand, you know, fifteen hundred years <laughs> leading up to Martin Luther. Um, but but that sacramental act of communion, the mass, um, big part of the cent- centrality of kind of Christian practice for, for a long time. And it wasn't until the Reformation when people started um, questioning kind of what what was behind this. And I think Martin Luther's big beef was that um, the sacrament was being used as a way to manipulate and control others rather than a means of grace. So in his work, um, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, he, he set out there like, hey, um, it's not the sacraments that's broken, it's the system behind it um, and, and the way they distribute to, to the laity and the way they're kind of holding them almost hostage and, and captive to this kind of merit system of if you don't take the communion or if you do or whatever, um, then that was the kind of the problem, the reform that he was looking for. And even this practice of like withholding um, the wine, withholding the cup from the lady because they couldn't handle it. You know, they would, they, they, they might drink it the wrong way or spill it. And we can't do that. It's so high and holy. This is so literally Jesus that uh, they're, they're just gonna like um, defame or, or like, um, abuse Jesus's own, you know, blood. So they would give him bread, but the priest would only be the one who would drink the wine. So Luther was like, no, nah, no, nah, let's, let's give both bread and wine to the laity. And this is a means of grace, not a way to control the laity. So, so that was, that was his kind of main turn in reform. And again, like there's a lot of history there with the sacraments. He, there's seven sacraments in the Catholic church. Luther boiled it down to two. Communion, Eucharist, Holy Communion, and and baptism were the two, because those were the two that Jesus commanded the church to do and connected God's word and promise to um, an element or earthly element. So baptism, water, Jesus said, go and baptize um, the earthly element with communion, bread and wine, and said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. Um, that's where Jesus, I mean, where Martin Luther connected the story of Jesus with the practice of of the Reformation. So just, just a couple of quick things. Um, first, to be the annoying podcast with a hot take, um, <laughs> hot take, uh, Either the Catholic Church and Lutheran were both wrong about what communion is and it should include feet washing, or mm-hmm. they're both wrong about it being a sacrament and feet washing should be a sacrament because uh, Jesus also said to do that and gave a specific symbolic reason for it. I just got to say, you know, it's, it's got to be there. It's got to be something. Yeah, that, that <laughs> was definitely a discussion in gross. seminary about well, then why aren't we uh, washing? I mean, even the catechism, Luther even ta- even lifts up confession a little bit mm-hmm. in yeah. a way that is almost sacramental. Like he talks of the importance of unconfession, corporate and individual. Um, 
for the forgiveness of sins. But then, you know, again, that could be the manipulative, uh, manipulating to people as well in terms of how often that kind of thing. But, but yeah, foot washing is definitely up there. It's been discussion. I can't, you know, seminars a long time ago. I can't remember what my professor saw. We, why we're not doing that or consider that a sacrament, but, yeah. um, but yeah. Yeah. Most churches still do it. We just don't call it a sacrament. Right. Yeah. Because as far as like distinguishing the Lutheran belief about communion to the others, um, Catholic Church really involved with like transubstantiation and literally this is like physically becomes blood while you're drinking it. Mm -hmm. right? Physically becomes bread, uh, you know, skin, I guess. Um, most people think that's kind of crazy outside of the Catholic Church. I'm not saying it is. You know, it's just one of those. It's shocking to people who haven't heard it. Um, I know that, you know, most of your Baptist Pentecostals, Protestant churches, a lot of them evangelicals will think it's completely symbolic. My understanding is the Lutheran church is somewhere in between those two. How does, how does that work? How are you in between symbolic and this is literally becoming blood? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look in the small catechism that Luther wrote, um, this little booklet, kind of a handbook for parents to teach youth about the faith, uh, he kind of goes through the tenets of of the faith, like the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, um, the sacraments, and kind of lays out um, kind of basic instructions. And he always asks, like, what does this mean? Or what is this? And when, when he's explaining the sacrament of the altar, Holy Communion, he says, um, it, what is this? What is it? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus under the bread and wine um, instituted by Christ. So, so he will say it is the true body and blood. He's just not explaining the mystery with that um, that big long word that you just said that I can never pronounce. Trans Um <laughs> uh, But but yeah. So so it, it is like um, there's definitely a true presence. You know, it's like what what emphasis do you put on? with the words that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, symbolic, remembering, or this is my body and blood given for you, or the is part, uh, which word are you going to put an emphasis on? And so Lutherans will we'll kind of do both. And, you know, we're kind of right there in the middle. You know, it is a remembrance meal. It's a meal where we remember who Jesus is and what he was about, why it matters. But also we believe him at his word when he says, it is my body and blood. We just don't explain away the mystery of like, it really becomes the elements has like a magical thing. Uh, hocus pocus. It literally the, the bread becomes his body and we're chewing on his meat kind of thing, which is his presence is physically there and literally there. We just won't explain what that mystery means. Mm. It's yeah. a little Greek Orthodox kind of, kind of take. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Big fan of that. Uh, so we've been told by other guests on the show that it's important that the Eucharist is administered by a man because he's representing Christ in the sacrament who was a male. Uh, how do you respond to this kind of belief of why only men should be priests or deliver the Eucharist? Yeah, I mean, that's where you kind of get in the the semantics of priest or pastor or minister. What what does that mean? A priest is a, a mediator between uh, someone, a human and God, you know, there's the priest to the geeks, you know, we're, 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 we're mediators between those things we geek out on and, and, or, but, you know, in terms of, um, Lutherans will say, you know, we, we lean more towards like pastor minister rather than, than a priest. And so, um, I know there are some traditions that say, since Christ was a man and so then pride, a uh, priest will be male as well. And they're the ones who administer the sacraments. Um, I, I'm, I'm just kind of like, well, you know, Jesus was a man. He also did miracles. I can't say that only men can do miracles or Christ was a, a man and he taught parables. So only men can teach parables and, and teach. There was a lot of things that Jesus did and he was a man. Why can't all, you know, male or female do those acts and same thing. So um, I, I'm just not, not there at that point as, as an argument of, of, I think, I think both male and female are, um, you know, I, I'm supportive of both, both administering the sacrament of Holy mm -hmm. Communion and baptizing and preaching. So that's kind of what yeah. I mean. Um, obviously, whole church, we always leave room for disagreement. But my biggest problem with that argument has always been with that same logic, then if it's important to be a man, just like Jesus was a man for the symbolic case, then it should be important that the person be a Jew, just like Jesus was a Jew for symbolic case, you know, similar height, maybe, you know, <laughs> like there's so many things that we don't hold to. It's like, OK, guys, at some point. For it to be symbolic doesn't mean it has to be the same. No, right. yeah. Only only men who are three cubits tall can yeah. give the Eucharist. <laughs> True. Wearing sandals exclusively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Four foot six. Yeah. Exactly. It's the only person. <laughs> yeah. 
So another belief we've heard around this is that it's important that we use real wine uh, because it's symbolic of the bitterness of death and because it is what Jesus told us to do. Uh, what's your take on that? What do you think about that? Yeah, for me, it's it's kind of like it goes to the heart of the original intent of, of Jesus's Last Supper celebrating the Passover, that wine was a part of that meal. And if you if you if you observe the Passover meal, each um, uh, part of the meal is uh, tells the story of the journey of the Hebrews from slavery into freedom and and why they're doing it. So there's like salt water for bitter tears and there's the wine uh, cup of salvation, the cup of sorrow. So there's, there's these things that play out to tell the story, to live the story, to experience, to taste the story. And so for me, Jesus used wine. So, so why, why, why shouldn't we, you know, there's a reason why we don't use like Doritos and Mountain Dew for communion. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, although, you know, I love both those things. But but bread and wine because that's what Jesus used at the Passover meal at his last supper. And for alcohol, and I understand like alcohol is an issue for folks in terms of those in recovery or addiction. So so why not use grape juice? An unfermented wine is grape juice. So you have an option. Um, but Lutherans also believe that Jesus is fully pr- present in both elements. So if you can only take wine because you can't have bread, you don't get just half of Jesus at the sacrament. You get you get Jesus fully. Same way if you don't take the cup or the wine and only take bread because you can't for some reason have what's offered you get the full you're not getting half a sacrament you're getting jesus fully in that element but those two together it kind of lifts up what he did what he was trying to get across and then and then moving on for for me like not using alcohol because it's just a a sin for me I, i just disagree where that the bible says it's a sin i think drunkenness abusing things um you know, sure, it can lead to sinful behavior. Same way, you know, there's good food out there. If I abuse it and eat too much, then then yeah, that indulgence. You know, why why aren't Big Macs a sin? Because oh, it's they just, are. It's just bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So sure. so that is like we don't use alcohol because it's just sinful to take alcohol. I just disagree whether alcohol is a sin. It's the it's what you do with it, the stewardship of it, the abuse of it that leads down an unhealthy road for for someone. So I would use wine because that's what Jesus used. But in a pinch, you know, if we had we were celebrating communion and we want to remember Jesus and 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 celebrate this sacrament while we um you know, an emergency situation, I, I'll, you know, we'll use some kind of sustenance, um, bread, Doritos, chips, water. Um, you know, who knows? It might be a miracle. Mountain Dew turned <laughs> to wine. Mountain Dew turned cool. to wine. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, my one pet peeve though, are the, the churches that, that use real wine, but then it's sweet wine. Cause in yeah. my mind at that point, if you're going to do the real thing, you, you might as well get that bitter taste you're supposed to get. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we use uh, Manischewitz, which is a very sweet wine. You had communion oh, at my, at my <laughs> you you've had communion at my church, Joshua. Did you notice that how whether the wine was sweet or whether it was a nice dry remember. back end of Merlot? <laughs> like you know, <laughs> we're not we're not taste testing yeah. Pinot Noir, right? We're we're celebrating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's also actually. A thing, I but... only do the Eucharist with the Cabernet Sauvignon personally. <laughs> right, I think that's what God intended. <laughs> uh, no, but, but that was our next question was, you know, some people think it's sinful to drink alcohol and real wine for communion is, is fake Christianity. So thank you yeah. for getting ahead of that. Yeah. But yeah. speaking of uh, at your church communion, they make their own bread and that's super cool. Yeah. And yeah. I want you to talk a little bit on that. But also, I, I know you do offer it's either non-alcoholic wine or grape juice for those who uh, who can't because I know our other friend, Christian, has been on the show a lot lately, the whole last month, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> the last month he was on the show more than TJ or, or me. Um, but he, uh, yeah, going to Southern Baptist Seminary can't have wine because of an agreement he has with the school, and uh, yeah. was very thankful for that option. So I know you also do that. Um, could yeah. you kind of elaborate yeah. why you have that option and what's what's up with the bread at a Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill? Yeah, you know, there's there's churches that use like unleavened wafers that taste like cardboard because that's you know part of the communion experience and. And serve wine or different kinds of wine. Nowhere, you know, in Scripture or Paul or or Jesus that say, you know, that if you go back to the the Passover meal as kind of the 
the the ground zero of when this began, then there are there is unleavened bread. You know, without leaven, it's a little bit more crusty or or like cardboard rather than freshly baked bread. But um, our church um, does, and each church um, may maybe has a different practice. Maybe they get their bread from a local baker, bakery, or they use pita bread, or whatever's easier to practical. There's practical elements to this too in times and how you commune, you know, a couple hundred people a Sunday, uh, what was, what can you use? Um, what's easy to tear off and, and give to folks for, for us, we have volunteers in our church that, that bake their own bread and has a recipe that it's not like a big, you know, loaf of, you know, yeast bread that, you know, is <laughs> cracks open and the steam rises up, but it, but it's, it's a, it's a little bit, um, you know, terrible, you know, you can tear it and <laughs> hand it to the next person. And then we also reckon, we also have gluten-free folks, people who, who yeah. can't have gluten. So we have a gluten-free wafer or bread option for folks who can't have gluten. And then we use that uh, grape juice in the middle of the tray for those who are either can't have wine or in recovery, or maybe they're little kids and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to take wine. I want to do some grape juice. So, um, but even the the sip of wine from these cups, you're not going to get the effect of alcohol in it. You're just kind of yeah. tasting what what that is. So, um, so that's that's our practice, and we kind of make all those options, make everyone feel welcome, while still trying to be a little bit more um, kind of the the OG meal back in the day when Jesus had yeah. his last supper. Yeah, but physically yeah. breaking the bread is just really as experience, super cool. Yep. Yeah, I think it's like the the communion crackers. They're horribly bland and also cost effective but nowhere in the bible true. does it say the yeah. bread has to taste bad yeah <laughs> just right. as it has to be unleavened but it was from one of the passover meals i mean we we, we could do a little bit more you know whatever we can play around with it <laughs> yeah. i mean I, i've prepared a small list of unleavened yeah. breads that taste better than a communion cracker that's has to be a large list it can't be small there's just no way <laughs> Uh, and, and we have we have church members we have church members that prepare the table on Sunday. Like I, part of my job is yeah, I preside over the meal. I lift up the bread and wine and say the words of the, of the institution and lift up what this meal is all about. And we sing hymns around it and celebrate that kind of like. I guess I guess every worship service has its kind of like Holy Week um, play that that rolls out. We we share. We read scripture and then preach and teach around it. But then we also do the hosannas as Jesus is riding in on, on Palm Sunday. And then we lift up and break the bread that is dying. And then you consume it. You are what you eat. You become what you eat. You know, you are what you eat. So you, you partake in this bread and wine. So I become like Jesus. And then since he is raised, I am raised to go out into the world. So that's kind of the, the worship narrative as we move through it. And so, um, I, I guess, um, I, my point is, is that, I have a, a host of volunteers and folks in my church who prepare the table and get the bread ready, ready and get the wine and cups ready. And they get that to, to distribute to our, our members. And so, yeah, there's a practical way. There's different ways to do it. Do you come to the altar? Do we take it to you? Do you come up? Do you do intinction? Do you take tear off the bread? How big is the bread? You know, how much do you get? You know, it's not just, I tell my, my youth when I do uh, communion instruction that this isn't a snack break during worship, but like the Jesus literally saying, here I am, consume me so that you can go out and be like me in the world. So that's, that's the main message of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever considered a uh playing Greta Van Fleet, Stardust chords during communion, you know, the whole, even the sinner, break the bread, drink the wine. Funny you shouldn't ask that. Like we, we <laughs> definitely, we definitely have choir anthems and, and songs and communion hymns and music playing while people are coming up. And again, it's not just an interlude. It's not just entertainment while you're waiting for your turn to come up and get a snack. It's the, hopefully what's being chosen is pointing to what's really happening at that meal. And, and a word of God is being brought to you. And Hey, if great man fleet is, is one of your hymns of choice uh, to lift <laughs> up what's going on in, in communion, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of that band. Cool. So how do you respond to those who'd make the Eucharist a greater or a smaller issue than you do? Hmm. Uh, you know, I just excommunicate them and never and shun them and never talk to them again. No, um, I that's that's the wrong answer, at least in my mind. Um, no, I they're like with all interpretations of of um practices within the Christian tradition that there are people who maybe emphasize it more than me and those who um, don't um, 
appreciate it as much as me or don't think it's as important. And so there's dialogue and conversation go around that of why we believe that certain way or how we were brought up or if there's other things we emphasize more than others. But but yeah, there's there's I'm not going to let it demean my own personal piety and practice, but but I'm open to the conversation of why or why not they believe this is an important part of the Christian practice. Hmm. Cool, cool, cool. So Eucharist just means Thanksgiving, which I think is Josh's favorite Bible fact. Uh, <laughs> it's a Greek word, Greek word meaning Thanksgiving. Good, yeah. good Greek yeah. word. Mm-hmm. So shouldn't this practice bring the church closer together rather than being another point of division and disagreement? I I think so, but but again, you know, is that is that how you're raised or the practice of how your church does it or don't do it? I mean, again, like I could probably go to Joshua's house on Christmas morning and be like, "Why are you doing Christmas this way? We do Christmas at my house this way. Why why are you why are you opening just one present and then having breakfast and not having opening all the presents first and then having you know there's there's ways of doing it and it's like is there a wrong or right way or is there um a way that you can kind of what's the intent of the celebration um, behind it all. And so that I would hope that there would be some diversity in terms of how we understand and practice this thing, but also some unity and in, in what it means and, and why it's important for Christian followers, those who follow Christ to partake in this sacrament. We Lutherans believe it's a means of grace. And so, you know, it's, it's that thing that sustains me where I hear that good word that I'm literally, uh, consuming Jesus. And so on a, on a weekly practice, that's what's going to sustain me and keep me going um, when I when I face the new week heading out to the world. Um, and so for me, it's important. And I would hope that would be a way to help strengthen others. But of course, like all things humans do, uh, wait, no, what do you mean? What do you mean you, you um, get your toothpaste out that way? You need to go this way. D- don't push from the middle of the toothpaste bottle, but go from the end. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, we're really arguing yeah. over that. Yeah, so, we only support rolling the tube for the yeah. record. True. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're, they're wrong. Just, yeah. Sensible. Yeah. Uh, so, Pastor Will, if, uh, if the bread is the flesh and the wine is the blood mm-hmm. during our Thanksgiving meal, um, w- what is turkey? Um, it's... Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to draw this around to American Thanksgiving, but you know, the, to, uh, you know, you know, uh, Thanksgiving a is a holiday in America and only in America. So it's exclusive, not, not many others. So, but the Eucharist is, is like Catholic lowercase C it's universal. All churches yeah. uh, celebrate it, not American Thanksgiving. So yeah, this is kind of Christian nationalist of you, Josh. Yeah, well, know. you know, there's a Thanksgiving in almost every continent and country. They're just different Thanksgivings for different reasons. But it yeah, is no, a holiday. No one, most no countries. one's saying that. Uh, don't be thankful. But, but I will. I mean, I granted, I will. I will share during my communion instruction with kids. I'm like, look, I, I'll share that Eucharist means Thanksgiving, <laughs> and that our Thanksgiving. Now, ask them about how they practice Thanksgiving in their home, like American yeah. Thanksgiving on on that Thursday with turkey or whatever. And it's like, yeah, do you do you have family members come over you don't see all the time? Yeah. Do you have people, um, you know, what do you do on that day to, to remember being thankful? Or do you do a service project? It's like, well, as a church, we gather as a family uh, to celebrate a Thanksgiving meal. And these are some family members we don't see all the time, or at least every day, um, maybe every other week, or maybe once a month, or maybe every every Sunday. But But this is our family meal of gathering to give thanks for who Jesus is and why it matters. And then we go out into the world to share it. So, yeah, yeah I, I make the analogy of a thanks <laughs> meal on, on uh, in November <laughs> for, for the meal. Understanding also that, yeah, America, America yeah. Thanksgiving yeah. is different from the rest yeah. of the world. Also not the only Thanksgiving, but yeah. American exactly. Thanksgiving is really good at clogging those arteries. So the blood of Christ can't get out, you know? Oof. Oof. <laughs> so are there any other notes you have about the different ways we take communion or treat this subject? Say that again, Christian. I was distracted by like gravy oh, arteries. Of those, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, so are there any other notes you have about the different ways we take communion or treat this subject? Yeah, I, mean, I think again, we keep going back to this verse of Paul. You know, he 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 wants a sense of reverence, you know, for this meal. And and sometimes we could take that too far. It's like, well, if you don't act a certain way or believe a certain way, or if you don't check off these boxes of confessing or believing this or believing the exact same way, open table, closed table way of, of doing communion, then then we're missing the point that Jesus is saying, um, this is a means of grace for you. And as you as you gather for this meal, as you gather to with my people, this is you hearing again that I lived and died and rose again for you. 
And so become what you eat, be my hands and feet in the world. So that that's that's kind of where, where I would go. So regardless yeah. of how you practice, whether you kneel or whether you stand, whether you say a prayer before or after or how you hold your hands or those kind of things, I, I would want there to be respect for this meal, but also some intentionality behind it of how you reflect on what you believe and what this means for you and impact your life and your community you're a part of, and then what it means the rest of the week, not just Sunday morning or Wednesday evening or whenever you worship. So um, for me- the Last Thursday in November. Yeah. Yeah. That that hopefully every day is a day of Thanksgiving, not just the last Thursday. Yeah. In yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So with that, you know, we always like to ask our guests if they could provide a single tangible action to help engender church unity. It seems like this whole episode has been about an action people could do, but <laughs> right. Um, let, let's uh, make it a little bit challenging. What's an action that people could do to better understand why others might view the Eucharist different than they do? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to be cliche and just say, well, you know, visit another church or, or read about it, you know, study. Um, for me, I think an action piece also is what I tell my congregation to and the youth and also adults who, who are taking communion to, to as not just um, go up for, for the snack and then go back to their seat and then draw on their bulletin what they're going to go shopping with later on um, af after church, you know, um, but, but maybe as they see people taking communion, walking by, that they're praying for that person, that they're lifting that person up that they have a good week, that whatever they're going through in life, they might not even know their name. They might even know that person very well, but to pray for them and lift them up and to look around them, um, the community that is gathering for this meal and see them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that, that would be my action piece. Next time you take communion, look around you of who's taking it with you and then pray for those people as everyone's taking communion together. Yeah. yeah so what, what's going to, what's going to change in the world around us? If everyone prays for everyone else taking communion with them. I think you just see yourself as as being a family, you know, your your brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, it, I, again, prayer doesn't change God as much as it changes us and softens our hearts uh, to live in the world. So I think that that's that's where I think it would it would lean into. Mm. Mm. Very yeah. nice. So before we start to wrap up, we always like to do our God moment segment. Uh, I haven't gotten to do this in a while too, Josh. I always make Josh go first, but I'm just going to ask him. Uh, to talk about a moment in his life recently where he's seen God, whether that be a blessing, a challenge, a moment of worship. Uh, so, Josh, do you have a God moment for us this week? Yeah. Um, last weekend, I got to go visit some family in Kentucky for Fourth of July kind of stuff and had a really great time and just blessed to reconnect with my family and just spend time with all of them. And um, when I got back, you guys know I'm doing a pollinator garden on the side of my house was really excited to see a monarch butterfly the other week because they're endangered now. Well, now in the tree across the street is a monarch butterfly nest. Super excited for that. So that was just a cool blessing and just kind of feel like, you know, maybe I'm doing a little little good in the world. Made me feel good. Nice. That's awesome. That's yeah. cool. Uh, I will go next to give you as much time as you need. Will, you probably have so many rattling around in there to just sift through and choose from. Uh, I have been blessed with the opportunity to like be in the position to manage my finances better, uh, which is based off of an attempted impulse buy, which I was not able to do because my credit was bad. And that encouraged me to actually take control of my finances and start building my credit like I should have been doing for the past five years, six years. Is this supposed to be your first ad? <laughs> Check out Rocket Money. <laughs> 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 brought to you by <laughs> but i'm super grateful that i've just been able to do that and my credit score has gone up by like 70 points it's, it's pretty nice oh, that is nice yeah yeah it's still not good but Better. very thankful yeah been very nice so will do you have a god moment for us yeah i was just able to go down and see my parents um well um Two weeks at, at summer camp. I was I've been at a, a camp that um, helped lead that I was a camper at a Lutheran camp up in the North Carolina mountains. That I was a camper at as a kid, and I was a camp counselor, and that's where I heard the call to ministry. And I'm able to take kids to this camp over the last you know many many years. And then my my kids basically like 
grew up there uh, in the summers and now they're both on staff. And so it's been fun to watch them be on staff at this camp over the last couple of weeks. I'm so proud of them. And then um, turn around and head down to the beach to be with my parents for my mom's 80th birthday. Uh, so that was great to celebrate that with her big milestone for her. Um, but then they live near the beach. So I went from the mountains to the beach and the water was great. Mm, saw great sunrise, um, was able to um, surf a little bit. The waves weren't huge, but I was able to catch a few waves in the this morning, I caught a wave and the water was so clear as I was surfing over the sandbar and went kind of the deeper water. I saw about a four foot uh, black Tim, black tip uh, shark go underneath me. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. That, that was pretty cool. And I don't, you know, they're not aggressive. So I wasn't really worried, but it was pretty cool to see a creature in the wild like that go underneath you. And you're not at an aquarium or something like that. So I was like, yeah, there you go. We're not alone. All God's creatures in this big wide ocean that we're a part of. Yeah, I love sharks. That's awesome. Literally. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Isn't your whole like life goal to punch a shark? And (laughs) so, uh, if you like this, TJ's to punch a shark. (laughs) I'm gonna. Okay. I have a point to prove. So please consider sharing the episode with a friend. Uh, You can also share with an enemy. You can share with your cousins. Got a lot of those. We talked about Thanksgiving a lot for some reason. So yeah, you know, tis the season. You can you share it with a shark? I can. So. If you're punch. listening on the AMP punch. YouTube channel, like and subscribe. Hang out with us in the Discord. It's like a fun little chat room. There's a bunch of different channels. Maybe you know, hang out with us. Talk to us. Uh, it's a lot easier than texting. Yeah, that's true. And you know, check out all the other shows we mentioned: the Anazel Ministry Podcast Network, a few different diets, the AMP Network, if you prefer. Net, the websites and show notes. We mentioned systematic ecology. You can check that out. Christian's been on the show a lot recently. Let nothing move you. I have a podcast, uh, Dummy for Theology. I just talk about theology and don't give you any solid answers. Just give you some questions to think about. And uh, TJ, TJ, you want to tell them about a show you might be starting soon? Soon, Hockey Night in Carolina will start. We don't have a concrete date. Yeah, I'm excited. It's already my favorite hockey podcast, just based on the logo. (laughs) Yeah, I'm still personally a fan of Digging In With Trip, the only podcast I've ever listened to a full episode of. (laughs) And it's not Trip Fuller, I assume. Nope, Trip Tracy. So we hope you enjoyed the show. Come back next week when we'll be interviewing Caitlin Shires about her newest book, The Ballad in the Bible. Then we will have another Dividing Scriptures episode. We'll be discussing scriptures the church has historically disagreed about, which is a lot of them. Uh, After that, we'll have another roundtable discussion. This time, focusing around what traps churches often fall into, not spike pits. So, <coughs> finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Yeah, because he's mm-hmm. not going to fall into a spike pit. He's going to fall Chan into not fall a into spam a spam email sent by me. That'll be the trap he falls for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with a link to our show. God willing. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Again, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast or on captivate.fm or on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a one-time tip through Captivate. Thank you for listening.